Good morning. It is good to see you. I didn't want to lie. I was like, I'm not sure that it's, uh, it's good to see you today. Um, what, a, what a great, wonderful day. We are in our third week of our series, uh, Chasing Carrots, The Endless Pursuit of More. Talking about what really makes a happy life. Because if you're always hungry for the next big thing, it's never going to be uh, satisfying because it's just, it's going to be like you're on that hamster wheel chasing carrots. And so it's time to step off the wheel and let's chase after something else. We looked at last couple of weeks, we looked at chasing fame, talked about money and stuff last week. Next week, we'll talk about approval and comfort. Uh, today, we're talking about perfectionism, chasing that which is perfect. Isn't it, it's, it's amusing to me, um, and maybe not like make you laugh funny, but in, a, in, a, in an odd way that we, we tend to do this when it comes to perfection. Um, if, if somebody we know, one of our kids, somebody we're close to messes up and isn't perfect, we tend to say, it's okay, it's all right, it, it's, it's fine. No, no one is perfect. Anybody, anyone ever said that? I'm raising my hand, me and Dakota. Okay, there's a few more, okay. Um, the rest of you are lying right now, so we, we know that no one is perfect. But here's the thing, when we mess up, we don't say that to ourselves. We tend to beat ourselves up, we feel shame, we feel like we're not worth anything. Um, and, and, and this is not something that just exists in the body of Christ. It's just, it's everywhere. I was listening to an interview this, this week, and it wasn't even new. It was old. It was a big, big Hollywood star. If I said his name, you'd recognize it probably. And he was talking about how he had, he had went through a time where he was, he's clean and sober right now, but, but, but 20 years ago he was addicted and, and all these kind of things. And he was talking about he had no self-worth and that, that he, he actually got to where he was hurting people, just being cruel because it would get a laugh in places. Just at dinner with friends and stuff, he would just say the meanest things. And, and people would laugh because it was like, oh, we can't believe you said that. And someone said to him, well, back in that, you know, back in the 80s when this was, that, that was sort of the humor of the day. Everybody kind of cut down each other, you know, burn each other kind of thing. It wasn't necessarily always mean spirited. And he actually said, no, I didn't care who I hurt. Because I didn't, I thought so little of myself that I thought, who would ever get their feelings hurt because of something I said? Certainly there's no way I can hurt anybody's feelings. And it's how we tend to see ourselves sometimes. We're very forgiving with others when they mess. Oh, come on, it's okay, nobody's perfect. But when we mess up, we see ourselves as worthless. Like we're not, I know I'm preaching to myself today. Okay, some of you are like, oh, what? No, I love myself. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> And here's the problem when we, when we get to the scriptures that to make things worse, this is what Jesus said in that famous Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter five, verse 48. But you are to be perfect even as your father in heaven is perfect. Oh, great. Thanks. Thanks, Jesus. There's no pressure there. Um, but the reality is we, we put this on ourselves. Most of us have unrealistic expectations of what we're supposed to be in our career as a parent and a lot of different things. We constantly live, and I feel like I need to put a mirror right on the other side of that camera just because I keep looking at you and you're going, mm -hmm. um, so we, we, we constantly live in a, a state of failure. Like we feel like we ever, I, I, I didn't come short, I came short. Uh, I, I didn't do enough. Um, and and, and we, we try to be the best we can. We know we're supposed to do that. We try to remember who we are in Christ. We try to all of those things. But then we take criticism really personally. We obsess about too many things. And, and, and we, we try to 
try to keep our world as perfect as we can. And the reality is it makes us inefficient and ineffective. Um, we, you know that it's hurting you. You know you shouldn't be this way. You shouldn't be living for perfection. We all know that. And yet there's a feeling like we've got to be that way if we're going to be successful, especially in the culture we live in. There are three, just real quick, I just want to because make sure, I, I, when I first started this, I knew I probably struggled with this, but I, I didn't realize how much. So there, there, I, I saw this identified this week, so maybe, maybe you'll, get, you'll find yourself in here somewhere. There are three types of perfectionists, three types of people that we would call perfectionists. Um, one, the first one, you want to jot this down, fill this in in your notes. The first one is the self-oriented perfectionist. This is somebody that you hold unrealistically high expectations of yourself. You battle with feelings of guilt. You're often obsessed to the point of inefficiency. You're prone to procrastinate and struggle with deep feelings of inadequacy. I, did, I, I got here and just stopped and went, okay. <laughs> All right, there we go. Um, was my picture in that right there? Did it have? Uh, and, and, and the reality is when you are this kind of perfectionist, as I mentioned, you tend to put things off. I, I used to think there's no way I can, I'm not a perfectionist because I procrastinate all the time. My office is always a mess. Like I don't, I, I just, I, I'm not, you don't look at where I am around me and think that's perfect. And yet and I've read this and realized it's that perfectionism that makes it that way because I, if I can't do it perfect, you know, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna clean up until I can catalog and organize everything and read it. I'm not gonna do this. My wife does not suffer from this at all. She can clean the house in ten minutes, and it's like, wow, how did you do that? Now I can't find anything for three months. If there's no telling where it went. How it, it's just. I tell her all the time, you didn't clean up, you just hit everything. It's not the same thing. You know, to, to me, that's not the same thing. It, it, it's, I, I can't just take stuff. And here's the problem. Here's why I can never get stuff done. And this is what makes this kind of perfectionism inefficient. I will see stuff on the counter and Annie will just take it, boop, boop, boop. It goes in that drawer. I'll do the same thing except when I open the drawer, I think, oh, well, there's a bunch of stuff that shouldn't be. And I wind up with that drawer, the contents of it everywhere because I'm trying to get that all put. That belongs over here. No, that shouldn't be in here. That, really, that should be... And, I, and, and then I wind up just, and, and here's the problem, most of the time, because I don't have time to do all that, I just don't take, I, I, I put it off. Anyway, that, that was just a personal explanation of what that first one was. Here's the second one. The first one is self-oriented. The second one is externally oriented perfectionist. And, and this is when, when the pressure comes from outside more than from yourself. You believe others expect you to be perfect. To cope with the pressure, you often use self-deprecating humor as a defense. You often feel alone, depressed, and desperate because you know that you will never be enough. Now, I thought I had nailed me on the first one, and I read this one, and I went, wait a minute. How can I be two? Because that sounds like the same. It comes from outside, though, and you feel like there's an intense pressure to be perfect. Um, I, I started to say, most of you understand, well, I don't know if any of you understand, maybe one other person in this room understand what it's like to be in, in the role of a pastor. And I'm not saying this, oh, let's get your little violins out. I, I don't mean it that way. But it, it, it can be very difficult because whether you put it on me or not, there is an expectation that I better be perfect. I better never have, can I tell you, I have, I have never in, in 11, and we finished 11 years. I should have mentioned this last week. Last Sunday, we finished 11 years here at, at C3. And I can tell you for a fact, in 11 years, I have never not smiled and waved at somebody that even remotely looked at me sideways at Walmart in Waynesboro or Charlottesville. Because I don't want to be that guy that like, oh, I saw the pastor at Walmart. He didn't even smile. He didn't even say. And so for especially the first few months when I didn't know a lot of people, man, if you even looked at me and kind of nodded in a Walmart, I was like, hey, I was the friendliest guy. Because there's that feeling. I don't, I got to be perfect. I don't want to, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I don't want to, you know. That comes from that external pressure, not so much what you do for yourself. So I'm like, great, I, I got one and two. I've always been a both and person. I don't like either or. 
Let's look at three and see if I can go for the, the trifecta. <laughs> so we've got self-oriented perfectionism, externally oriented perfectionism, and then others oriented. Now this is a little different than external. This is when you now, whether it's from yourself or it's coming from external, now you expect others to live up to your impossible standards. And because you tend to lack empathy, because they're so hard on yourself, you often tear others down or use abrasive and demeaning humor toward those who don't meet your standards. Thank goodness, I don't think I'm hitting the trifecta because I, I, I feel like I, I don't delve into this. Some of you are going, yep, that's you. Forgive me if it is. I'm, I'm apparently not as perfect as I need to be. Okay. You, can I, it was tough to get ready to practice. I can't believe I said practice. Study for this message this week and not spiral. Just spiral down into a pit of despair as I begin to read all the spiritual issues I have with myself. Let's real quick, let's look at because I do want to depart a little bit because perfectionism is something that can exist when it comes to um, when it comes to the psychological state of who we are, and perfectionism is a thing that we can wrestle with, and, and this talks about that. But I, I kind of want to frame it in more of a biblical context, if we can, spiritually, because there are some problems with perfectionism outside of the realm of just psychology and things that that, that are bad for you just as a person, but even spiritually. So let's. I, I want to look at those problems, specifically spiritual problems. Um, Here's the first spiritual problem with perfectionism. One, it can be an attempt to cover sin. An attempt to cover sin. I, I know that, that sounds harsh. I'm like, well, oh, no, but let's, let's go to the scriptures. All the way back to almost to the beginning, Genesis chapter 3. We know the story in Genesis chapter 3. If you know that story of a creation, God makes man and woman. And the beginning of chapter 3 tells the story of how Eve is tempted by the serpent. She... Um, so he drags Adam into it and the reality is if he'd have done the right thing she wouldn't have been tempted by the serpent anyway I won't get into all that it, it all goes back to his, his fault in my opinion but, but they both do something and disobey God he said don't eat of this one tree that's it you got the whole garden don't eat of that one tree they both eat of the tree and this is the moment in, in verse 7 that's talking about at that moment verse 7 says their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Verse 9, Then the Lord called to the man, Where are you? He replied, He replied, This is Adam speaking, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Now, I can remember hearing this story as a kid. It was always fun to watch how this got put on a flannel graph board because, you know, putting naked people in front of little kids is probably the best thing in the world uh, unless you're in, in the public school today. But that's... Uh, but, but, but when I was growing up, that was like something frowned upon a little bit. So it was always Adam and Eve and, and the fig leaves were on there pretty quick. And, and I, I remember hearing the story and I've always thought that, that when they, as soon as they ate the fruit, they suddenly realized, oh, I don't have any clothes on. Um, I don't think that's the, the case anymore. As an adult, when I read this story, it says their eyes were opened and it says that they felt shame because of their nakedness. I don't think their eyes were open in the sense they didn't realize that they weren't clothed before. I think their eyes were open to the reality of the sin that had come into their life. And here's the, the proof of that. The Bible says they immediately made fig leaves and covered themselves, right? But then when they heard God, they ran and hid. And Adam said, we ran and hid because we were naked. Okay, did the fig leaves fall off after they put them on and then God came and said, so you understand, like, it, it doesn't make sense here. Why do you put fig leaves on to cover yourself, but then you run and hide in the trees because, no, you, you were covered. You put the fig leaves on. Like, you see how it doesn't work? And, and that's because sin does that. It, it, it makes you, you can't cover it. That's why I said perfectionism can be an attempt to cover sin. 
It, it's this idea. And here's, here's where Adam and Eve were perfect until they sinned. But in that moment, then they sought out their own, their perfectionism was them trying to be like they were before. Trying to cover up the fact that they had this realization there was sin in their life and now there's shame and now there's all of these feelings they didn't have before. And they're running, trying to hide from that. That's why the, the fig leaves didn't work. It wasn't that they didn't cover them. It's that it didn't work to cover their sin. It didn't work to cover up what they were feeling because what they were feeling wasn't really about the nakedness. I'm not advocating we go back to that. I'm just saying that, that it, it's, it, that wasn't the problem. That wasn't the root cause. That's why they had to run and hide even though they, they were covered in fig leaves. You can't cover, and, and a lot of times, perfectionism, and the reason that it can be very dangerous in our life, especially as believers, is that perfectionism is something we can try to use to cover up areas in our life that really God can only fix. There are areas in our life that are sinful, that we, we, we fall into, that we, that we are, are in, that we shouldn't be. And if, if we try to make everything around us perfect, to try to cover up the fact that internally we're not in place. And I'm talking primarily to believers, but, but this works for those that haven't made a choice to follow Christ. You'll see them trying everything they can to live a life that's perfect except for that part, and it never works. I always discover this when I'll be talking to somebody who I, I can tell, and, and you say, well, are you judging? Yeah, I'm, I'm judging based on their lifestyle and most of the things like if so this is somebody that followed Christ, they wouldn't do these things. So in a sense, yeah, I'm judging. I don't think it's wrong. I'm not judging them in any way. I'm not judging myself. But I'll look at somebody like that and I'll ask him, I'm trying to give them like the answer. You need Jesus, you know, in your life. And, and it's always funny to me that, that the answers they give me will always list the things that they feel like they're doing that makes them okay. I've run into people and without me saying a word, there's, there, there's a sense of conviction because darkness and light can't, you know, and there's light in you, it kind of reveals darkness. And any, any of you have a friend like that, am I all alone? You know, you'd run into somebody and they're like, oh, they start giving you excuses and you hadn't said anything. And I'll, I'll run into somebody I've seen in a while, I know they probably aren't living right, they aren't really following Christ like they should, and I'll say, hey, how you doing? Oh, good, hey, you know what? I, I'm not, I, I see you on a praise team now in my church. Okay. You know, it's like they'll start listing things that they, they think make them spiritually okay. And the reality is, all I care about is the condition of their heart. But they'll, they'll you know, or they'll say, hey, you know, I, I, I work down at the, the homeless shelter now, three days a week. Well, that's great. That's good. And, and you tend to hear this a lot um, when somebody who has lived a life that's, especially one that's very open and public and probably wasn't following Christ, and they die, go to that funeral. You will hear a list of all the things that they tried to do to be perfect, or at least that people tried to perfect them into, you know. Um, it, it's, and, and I feel for anybody having to preach that funeral, it's tough. But I, 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 I've not had to do many of those, thank goodness, any of those that I can think of necessarily, but I, I have friends that have. And, and one thing that, that you, you, as a minister, you try not to do, you try not to preach them into heaven after they're gone. Like it's, you know, at some point, I mean, you don't want to get up and say, we're here together to honor this person. They're roasting in hell right now. I mean, you don't do that. But on the other hand, I've seen people, and they were good. They were a good person. They volunteered of their time. They were, they smiled and they never once kicked a dog. They, I mean, you know, they'll, they'll, you, and all of that is, is trying to create a perfect world around you to attempt to cover up. You're sewing fig leaves together. And the thing is, you need a heart change because you can't, the only thing that can cover sin is the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that paid the price for sin. And it's nothing you do. You have to put your faith in him. L Lydia gave us that example this morning. She got up and said, I love Jesus. I believe in him. And what that tells me that is Lydia is perfect. She never does anything wrong. She never disobeys. She never, yeah. 
I wait, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, like, I'm waiting for mama to go. And, and I'm just going, that's true. No, she did. Yeah, no, yeah. Um, I've had a conversation with Lydia. I can tell you for a fact, that's probably not true. She, she, <clears throat> that child, I mean, every child has a strong will. I, I hate to tell James Thompson that. I'm not, I've never met a child without a strong will. But, 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 but I will tell you this. Because Lydia has placed her faith in Jesus, she doesn't have to be perfect. Because he covers her sin. And she believes and she puts her faith in him. So, so that's the first problem with perfection is it's an attempt to cover sin. It, here's the second problem. It can be an attempt to mask insecurity. And maybe not necessarily sinful behavior or immorality, but just things that you feel weak, you're not sure of, you're insecure. And you can kind of use perfectionism to try to make yourself better than you were. There's a story in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, we see, uh, you know, Moses comes on the scene. Children of Israel have, uh, have, have been in Egypt now for a long time. The Bible says that, you know, Joseph, is the, how they got there. Joseph went, brothers sold him into slavery. This has turned into a much longer story than it meant to be. But, but it's, Joseph is there. He rises to power because of God. You know, using them to interpret dreams of Pharaoh makes them second in command. They have one of the dreams is of a famine, seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. Joseph's in charge. He saves up all the food from the plenty years. Now they have food. And then the famine sweeps all everywhere. And they're the only ones with food. So Joseph's brothers, his family, the other brothers of, of, of his sons of Israel, they go to, the, to Egypt to find to get food. They discover it's Joseph, he reconciles with them, he moves the whole family to Egypt and they live in prosperity, begin to just grow like over in the land of Goshen, they begin to thrive, they're this. And the Bible says that there came a time when the Pharaoh that was in charge did not remember who Joseph was. Now we're past the time and he doesn't have any, he doesn't know who Joseph does. I mean, all he knows is there's a bunch of people living here that are not Egyptian and we're going to put them to work. And, and they are enslaved in Egypt. Along comes Moses. Um, he, he, a miraculous story of how he even survived as a baby, gets it. And, and, and Moses, God chooses Moses to help deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. They go through that whole process of all the plagues, um, you know, uh, Charlton Heston parts the waters, uh, it's, it's, this is Moses in my mind, and then and 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 they get out and they get out of Egypt. Now they're in the wilderness. They're headed to the, the promised land, back to where they're supposed to be, and they come to the mountain, Mount Sinai, and God wants to meet with them. And Moses goes up, and we know the whole story. Of the ten, the original, you know, originally he gives them the, the, these commandments. Um, and, and the people kind of build a golden calf and all that happens, he goes down and finally Moses goes back, meets with God and, and he gives them the 10 commandments. And this is, this is where the story picks up. Exodus 34, verse 29. When Moses came down Mount Sinai, carrying the two stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant, he wasn't aware that his face had become radiant because he had spoken to the Lord. So when Aaron and the people of Israel saw the radiance of Moses' face. They were afraid to come near him. But Moses called out to them and asked Aaron and all the leaders of the community to come over. And he talked with them. Then all the people of Israel approached him and Moses gave them all the instructions the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking with them, he covered his face with a veil. But whenever he went into the tent of meeting, to speak with the Lord, he would remove the veil until he came out again. Then he would give the people whatever instructions the Lord had given him. And the people of Israel would see the radiant glow of his face. So he would put the veil over his face until he returned to speak with the Lord. Now, we, we have this, this picture of Moses. And, I, and I, uh, again, you hear these stories as a, a younger in life and I cannot always say, yeah, Moses spends time with God and he's around God so much that his face literally is glowing because he's around the very presence of God. And he doesn't even realize it at first. He comes down and people are scared. So he, he, he has to cover his face with a veil 
so it doesn't frighten the people. And, but then I read this and I actually read what it says and it, and it says that they were frightened at first and he called them over and then they came over and approached him. And when he was done talking with them, then he put the veil on. So now I'm starting to wonder, wait, I don't think he had to cover his face to keep the, because they came over once they realized it was him, he was okay. But then he would cover his, and then it says he continued this practice. He would go meet with God in the tent of meeting, or the tab, we call the tabernacle. He would meet with God and then he would, he would come out and he would put the veil on. But it, then it, it says, and the people of Israel would see the radiant glow of his face. So apparently he didn't put the veil on right away. I mean, they could see something. We get a picture of, of what was really happening here in 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul is using this story of Moses as an example of, of why people aren't moving from their, their, their faith in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, we would call it, to the gospel of Christ, the following Christ. And he says this in verse 13 of chapter three, 2 Corinthians. We are not like Moses, who put a veil over his face so the people of Israel would not see the glory, even though it was destined to fade away. Now, well, Paul introduces something here that we that, that kind of gives us a little insight into what was really happening with Moses. Paul says the glory of God was fading away. The glory came from Moses spending time on the mountain. And it didn't go away right away, obviously, because the people could see his face radiant. He put the veil on. But the implication is that the glory faded. And I really do believe that Moses wore that veil more to not let the people know the glory was gone than to make the people feel safe because we already know it's established that people were people came and listened to him the first time before he put the veil on he didn't have to put the veil on to talk to people and we know he must not put it on right away because he let people when there was still a little glow left he made sure they saw that and, and, and the picture we have here is Moses who we know from his beginnings, you know, he had to have, when God called him at the burning bush, he said, I can't do it. I have a stutter. I can't speak well. And he said, I'll have your brother Aaron go with you. And, and we know Moses dealt with those insecurities. You can see it all through his story. So this is not a shock that Moses is wrestling with some things like he's not enough. He's not adequate enough to do what God's called him to do. But here we see Moses, he actually meets with God. And that's a good thing. Once he realizes there's evidence of this fact, I'm glowing, people can see, they can see the anointing of God on his life. But as Paul says, that began to fade. Moses then kept the veil on so that the people couldn't tell that the glory was fading because with that radiance came some authority. I've been with God. Now, Moses had still been with God. He was still hearing from God. He was just as anointed, but in his insecure mind, I need to make sure that people will listen to me and they may not. And so he's covering this veil. Paul alludes to that later in this chapter. He says, that's why people have covered their, their hearts are covered with the veil. And, and they, they, they won't see the real glory of Jesus because they're still, they're, they're hiding the fact that the glory is no longer in the covenant, in the old covenant that it's now in Christ, he has fulfilled the old covenant. They won't move on and they're still covering their face like Moses covered his face, trying to hide those insecurities. That's a, another problem with perfectionism. We, we, we may not be trying to cover up for sin in our life, but we, we try to make things as perfect as we can to hide the fact that we do it. This is why even though you've been fighting and screaming all the way to church, you make sure the kids have dried up the tears and are all smiley, smiling by the time you walk in the door. Because we won't want anybody to realize that maybe things weren't perfect on our way to church. Again, I know I'm talking about my experience. It's, it's, I love at this older stage of life where I can drive by myself to church. Nobody is there to distract me, to bring me down. So, if we're not careful, we can try to make our world perfect to cover up those areas that we're insecure of. The reality is those insecure areas, what we, we've said it a hundred times today, we were singing about it. Nothing is impossible. 
He is our security. He is where our faith is. He is enough. And when we try to make our everything we can control perfect, trying to cover up the fact we're not enough, then we deny it. And we, we actually move into this third thing. Not an attempt to cover sin, an attempt to mask insecurity, but here's the third problem. Perfectionism can be an attempt to replace grace. To replace the grace of God. Because see, the grace of God is what extends to us and keeps us from needing to be perfect. And so if we're not careful, if we try to control our world and make everything perfect, what we're trying to do is replace the purpose of the grace of God in our lives. Paul said this in Romans chapter 3, verse 20. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. Paul says nobody can be made right with God by just by doing what the law commands. In other words, you can't make your life perfect enough to be made right with God. You can't do it. You can't cover up sin. You can't cover up your, you might think you're covered up. You're not going to cover up your insecurity. You can't replace grace. He says the law is just there to show us how simple. He's saying by yourself, you can't be perfect enough for God. That's why you need the grace of God. You can't do it by yourself. And, 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 and he, there's an implied in this there's, the question isn't here, but I, I suspect somebody yelled this out, and that's why he answered the way he did. He says, no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. And somebody said, well, then why do we have the law? Okay, I, just, I, I assume that's kind of what happened. Because then he says, the law simply shows us how sinful we are. That's the purpose of the law. It's just to reveal, it's to show us that you can't do it by yourself. You can't do it by yourself. Uh, just as a reminder, you know, we think of the Ten Commandments. We have to follow those, right? Well, a, a good Pharisee had about 613 commandments. It wasn't just ten. We said, we're talking about keeping the law. It was way more than that. And, and, and can I tell you, if it's just about doing those, I, I, I can tell you I, I'm a, I'm a three-strike offender already. If, it's, if, I, if I'm trying to live life just by living by, even not even, let's not worry about the 613. Let's just look at the ten. And, and, and before I move into the uh, perfectionism of self-deprecation that I read about earlier, to me, I'm going to put it. I'm going to put this back on you because you're all your halos are shining perfectly this morning. <laughs> Let's just look at a few of the top ten. Who in here has never lied? Thank you for not lying. <laughs> Strike one. Um, anybody in here? Uh, Sam will say this, and this is going to be because this one gets a little specific. Anybody ever stolen anything? Oh, I said that wrong. I mean, I've never stolen anything. And hands are going up. We've well, we got a bunch of thieves that are here. All right, Jeff, we talked about the other day. We definitely need some cameras around the church. Did anybody steal the hose from behind the church? That's, it was back there a couple of weeks ago. And I, Dakota, do you have a new hose at your house? Is that what I'm hearing? The new one that I filled this baptistry with is locked away. It's no longer outside. <laughs> no, strike two. Anybody ever, um, anybody ever coveted anything else that anybody else had? Any, yeah, I went the other way with that one too. Yeah, hand, hands everywhere. I should just say this. Anybody ever watch HDTV? <laughs> that, that should just be called Channel of Covet. That, that's, that's all it ought to be called. I, I just, I, 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 you know, I... I have enough problems with inadequacy. I'll come in and Annie's always watching that. And I come in and I look and I go, oh, this is, and now I feel like everything's in that. I, you don't have the kitchen you deserve. You don't have the, like nothing's right, you know. I love when they come in and they're doing, you ever watch one of those shows? And they're coming in and they're doing, they're, 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 they're we, oh, we've got to fix all this. And you're looking at the before going, oh, I would love that kitchen. That's amazing. Like, and they're like, this is terrible. Like, Cares, I like, oh, out of date. He's happy. Rip them all out. I'm going, hey, you can just bring them to my house because that looks amazing. I would take it. I'll take it. You know. Here's the reality, though. Paul is saying the law is not there for you to keep. You can't keep it. You're going to fail. We we are all basically a bunch of failures. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Which is Paul had already said this. 
you know, anyway. His point is this, until you see your need, until you see yourself as a failure, as a sinner, then you will never see your need for a savior. And that's what the purpose of the law was, was to say, look, you're not going to be able to keep this. This is perfection. This is what you should be living like. The, we, don't, we don't reject the law. The law is not gone. It's not whatever. I love when people say, we're in the new covenant now. I said, so can we murder people now? Because does that mean? Well, we don't toss out the law. We don't toss out those things. We live in a world where I feel like that's where we are. Not from a religious standpoint, but they've tossed out all of that. The reality is, and that's why Jesus was so clear on it. Look, it's not about keeping the law. It's about a heart thing. But if, if, if the law can't make us right, then how are we made right? Thank goodness Paul didn't just leave it there. Verse 21, he picks up. But now, he says, God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. Paul is saying, listen, stop trying to, you can't keep the law. It's impossible. That wasn't even the purpose. The law was there to show you that you're a sinner. Why? Because until you realize you're a sinner, you don't know you need a savior. And he's made us right. All you've got to do is have faith in Jesus Christ. That's the grace of Jesus Christ. And the problem is that we, in our perfection, our attempt at perfectionism, a lot of times we are attempting to replace the grace of Christ. We are literally trying to keep the law in a sense. We are, we are trying to make the world around us perfect instead of leaning into Christ. Now, now listen, I, I'm not advocating that you just let everything go. <laughs> you know, just... Don't do it. Because Paul deals with that later. He says, listen, does that mean you don't have to, you have no responsibility? He says, of course not. Does this mean you should just go sin and do whatever you want? No, that's not the point of the grace of Christ. But you trying to do it yourself is just as much sin as you just sinning openly. He says, let the grace of God do what it's supposed to do. Have your faith in Jesus Christ. The problem is we live, and, and there are parts of the world that are way worse at this than we like to point to. I, you know, I, when I traveled, I saw this so glaringly. It's one of the biggest issues in the, in the body of Christ in, in West Africa. Witchcraft is so prevalent there and so much a part of their history that they, they deal with synchronism there. And, and, and it's easy to see because they, they want to follow Christ, but they'll still, they got grandpa's idols that they, they kept around because they were grandpa's and they still rub them for good luck on their way out the door. But they want Jesus, Jesus, and well, just in case. And it's this mixture. It's easy to see and it's easy to condemn. And the reality is we are just as steeped in it here as they are there. It may not look as obvious, but we in our attempt and our strive for our worlds to be perfect, we are basically saying, I want, I need Jesus and fill in the blank. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I'm going to try to make my world perfect. And, I want, and I'm going to add Jesus. I'm gonna, basically, here's what we do. We get it backwards. I'm going to do everything I can to make my world perfect. And I'm going to ask Jesus to bless it. That, that's not what the scripture says. It says, you are imperfect. Acknowledge it and let him be your perfection. It should be Jesus plus nothing. Nothing else. That's why, that's what the scriptures mean when, when it talks about the fact that he is all sufficient. He's even, as we sang this morning, he's not just enough, he's more than enough. He's more than what you need. And yet we are constantly striving in our attempt for perfectionism to make things because we have this misguided attempt that our, our vision or view of what we think perfectionism ought to look like. And here's the problem. For you to lean into his grace instead of replacing it with your perfectionism means you have to accept what he says is perfect. And you might have a different idea of what perfect looks like. And so we attempt to do that. And when we do that, we try to re replace the grace of God. 
Here, here's the two compared, the difference in the two. Perfectionism says, it's what I do in life that matters. The grace of God says, it's what Jesus has done that matters. Perfectionism is all about me. It's about me working hard, striving, whatever. Grace is all about Jesus. It's all about him. Perfectionism says, if I obey, then God will love me. If I work hard enough, if I do the right things, then I'll have favor with God. Now that describes about every other world religion that you can think of. If I don't make whoever I call God, if I don't make him mad, my life will be okay. Any of you know somebody like that? That thinks if you don't make your God mad, then he'll like you enough to make things okay? Anybody? <laughs> and when things don't go perfect in your life, then you must have made God mad. You must have made God in your life mad. That's perfectionism. Grace says, God loves me. And that's why I can obey him. My obedience doesn't come in an attempt to gain his love. My obedience comes from a place of love. He loves me so much that I'm choosing to obey him. I don't walk in fear that if I don't obey, Matter of fact, I see God's love the most when I am completely and totally unfaithful to him. Because it's in those moments I see his faithfulness even though I fail completely. He is faithful. That's what John meant when he said, if we confess our sins, which is really, that sounds sweet. Oh, if we confess our sins, that means if you are brutally honest and humble yourself and admit I am a failure, I have messed up. He says, if you do that, he is faithful and just. He doesn't come down on you. He doesn't punish you. He says he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Perfectionism is about trying to win God's approval. This is the, the, the trailer for next week. This is not me preaching next week. Perfectionism is trying to win God's approval. Grace is living up from God's approval. You have his approval and so you live accordingly. So basically, grace or living in Christ takes that pressure off of you to be perfect. If you will not try to cover your sin and just admit I'm a sinner. If you will not try to attempt to cover your insecurities and just say, I'm not perfect. There's some theories in my life. I need Jesus. I can't live without him. I need the power of the Holy Spirit in my life because there's some areas that I'm not adequate at. And if you will not attempt to replace the grace of God with your perfectionism, it can take the pressure off of having to live that way. Let me just wrap up with this. Grace, when we accept God's grace, it means something. Grace means that we can choose. A couple of things. Here's the first one. Grace means we can choose people over perfection. Because, I don't know if you caught a theme there, but everything about perfection has to do with us. It's all about me. It's me, 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 me. And so people, others, tend to take a back seat when you live in perfection. Grace enables you to choose people over perfectionism. We, we, hear, we hear the story in Luke chapter 10, verse 38. As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village. We know in other gospels it's Bethany, where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister, I don't know why I went into that voice. It just sounded like that's how she would say. Doesn't, and I'm quite certain her hands were right in this posture. Doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, 
You were worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. He doesn't really condemn Martha for fixing dinner. He doesn't say, Martha, you shouldn't even be fixing dinner. We should all just fast all the time. I'm glad he didn't say that. Um, he doesn't necessarily condemn her, but he does tell her, listen, you are so concerned with this. You, Mary has discovered, and, and, and to give this story context, we know that in this story, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem where he will be betrayed, beaten, go to the cross. He's on his way to suffer the greatest thing ever. And somehow Mary has this sense of, I need all the time I can with Jesus. Now, it doesn't really, Jesus doesn't get into what it was she discovered, but I think that's what it was. It was time with him at his feet, sitting, listening, spending time in Jesus' presence. He says, that's what really matters. And Martha, you were so worried about the details. And the details are okay. Details aren't wrong. They're not sinful. They're not bad. But you are allowing them to distract you from the thing that's more important in this moment. And in this moment, sitting in my presence is the most important thing that can happen. Mary has discovered that. When you choose, when you allow grace to do what it's supposed to do in your life, then you get to choose people over perfection. You get to choose the higher thing than, than what you think is important. And too many times, even in doing things that are that I would call somewhat religious. And I don't use that in a really bad way necessarily. We do a lot of religious things that are, good, that are fine. But if we're not careful, we even as the body of Christ can exalt programs over people. People always got to be the priority. When you allow the grace of God to come into your life, suddenly people become to be over perfectionists. So it means that in those moments where you need this and this and this to be for your life to be perfect, but you might have to stop and interrupt your perfect world to deal with people. God says, people is the choice you make. You get to choose people over perfection. Here's the second thing. Grace means we can choose people over perfection. It also means we can choose perfect love over perfect performance. Perfect love over perfect performance. I would not have told you before I was preparing this this week that the answer to fix my strive for perfectionism, I chase my pursuit of things being perfect in my life was the love of God. This is what John says in 1 John 4. Earlier in that chapter, I love it. It's one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. 1 John 4 you know, he says, love is from God and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. Beloved, love one another. I know that sounds a little King James and that's, that's okay. That's, that's the words the song used because that's the song in my head right now. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not, Knoweth not God, for God is love. So, beloved, let us love one another. First John 4, 7 and 8. See, that's how, <laughs> as a kid, thank you, Mom. I, I, you know, I, I, I know that passage. I love that passage. That, this is a few verses after that. John is still, he's beginning to unpack all of that. And he says this in verse 17. As we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment and this shows we have not fully experienced his perfect love. The reality is this, perfectionism, 
The strive for perfectionism is really about trying to cover for our deepest fears. Because all of those things that we try to use perfectionism to, to cover up, to mask, are fear-based. Inadequacy, rejection, intimacy, all of those things that we, we really need and we're afraid of those things. We're afraid of not being enough. We're afraid of not having those things we need. And because of that fear, we choose perfectionism or performance or we, we try to make everything perfect around us. And the only thing that can get rid of fear is love. We can choose love over performance, over fear. So the reality is, stop striving for perfectionism. Stop trying to be perfect. Choose people over perfectionism. Choose, choose perfect love over perfect performance. Now, now here's the problem. We started this out by me reading you Matthew 5 and 48, where Jesus said, you should be perfect. And then I spent the next few minutes, longer than I needed, telling you, you don't need to be perfect. So which, who, who are we going to believe today? Me or Jesus? Well, let's put, chat, let's put verse 48 in some context. Okay, let's back up. Matthew 5, 43, this is what Jesus is saying in this conversation. You have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. Verse 48. But you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. So here's the context of this statement he makes in verse 48. When he says to be perfect, he's not describing your behavior. He's not saying you should act perfect, be perfect, don't do anything wrong, be completely perfect. He's saying you should love the way the Father loves. You should be perfect in your love. Matter of fact, the Greek word that's there that's used, that word perfect is the word teleos. And it does not mean without sin, like perfect, like we would think of in that statement. Matter of fact, teleos has the same root word as the Greek word to telestai, which is the word that Jesus used on the cross when he said it is finished, it is complete. It was an accounting term. It has been completed. It has been uh, reconciled. It has been completely and totally finished. It's the same root. And so what Jesus is saying in this moment, he's talking about how the law says, yeah, don't, or even at some point it says, you know, love your neighbor. And the implication is that you can hate everybody else. He's saying, no, I say, love your enemy. Pray for those that persecute you. Love your enemies. Do, do, do these things. You should love. And then he says, you should be completely mature, spiritually mature, be perfect in your love. In other words, fulfill your perfect purpose, the reason you're here. What's your purpose? If you're not sure, turn to your worship program and look right under the date. It's to love God and love people. That's your purpose. That's the great commandment. He says, you are to love, you're to be complete and perfect in your love for God, your love for people. There's, a, there's an author that writes about perfectionism named Brene Brown. She said, that, I love this quote, when perfectionism is driving us, shame is riding shotgun 
and fear is the annoying backseat driver. <laughs> when perfectionism is driving, shame is riding shotgun, and fear is the annoying backseat driver. Those things come with that. Here's the reality. I, I, I have admitted this over and over again probably too much. But I wrestle with this so much. And what, what I'm discovering and experiencing is that I don't wrestle with perfectionism. I wrestle with fear. The fear of being inadequate, of failing, of not measuring up. And, and, and if I'm not careful, I can be guilty of using performance and achievements, things like that, to cover my deepest insecurities. I, 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 I will admit this. There's been times I've been in a room and felt completely inadequate, felt very insecure, like I did not belong in the room. I'm not sure why I'm here. Everybody in here is smarter than me. And it didn't take me long. Within about five minutes, you would have found out I had a master's degree. I didn't do it on purpose. I would worked that into the conversation. And it was an attempt to list an achievement to make myself a little... And so what, what does that mean? It doesn't mean? It doesn't mean nothing. The fact that I said it doesn't mean nothing, I can tell you, apparently it wasn't a great master. <laughs> it wasn't a master's in English. <laughs> but we tend to do that. We tend to kind of default to achievements, to things, to try to do this. And here's the reality, and this is what I'm hoping we can grasp today. We need to shift from showing people how good we are to showing them how good God is. That's what matters. It's not about us. We need to see how good God is and the fact that he loves everybody. That's his goodness. He loves you. And so I, I think sometimes in our attempt to try to be, you know, we've used this language a lot in the last, uh, I feel like in the last few weeks over a couple different series, We've, we've said this, we've read scripture and talked about the fact that we are ambassadors of Christ. We are his representatives and that's true. The problem is I think we distill that sometimes through a, a religious framework and we see that as if we are ambassadors of Christ, we have this standard we have to live up to. And that's true. But we've made the standard about what we do, who we are, what we accomplish let me, oh, I didn't say that right. Let me put it in the rights in Christ. If we throw that line in it, it makes everything else okay. But the reality is it's all about us. And the, the ambassadors of Christ he's looking for are not perfect vessels that have no flaws. He's looking for broken vessels that show his love. That's the perfectionism of Christ. That's the perfect he's looking for when he says be perfect is perfectly revealing who he is. That's the perfectionism he longs for. And if we're not careful, we can attempt to replace that and cover it up and mask it with all of our attempts to do everything we feel like we have to do to be perfect. So let me let you off the hook today. You're not perfect. You're not gonna be perfect. You're not gonna ever succeed. You're not ever gonna make it God bless you. you know. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great just to end right there? <laughs> you're not. You're a complete failure. So be ye perfect as God is perfect. And that is the crux. That's the thing that is the hardest part. Is that the gospel tells us to acknowledge the fact that you're a sinner. That's what it says. You need to acknowledge. That's the first thing you tell anybody that wants to come to Christ. Acknowledge that you are a sinner and you need to repent of that sin. You need to change direction. You need to come to know Christ. But then we, we say, and then you should live perfect. Both of those things are true. It's just that if you take Christ out of that scenario, you now all you've got is religiosity. Now you don't have what you don't have true Christianity. You've got a religious system where you're coming and attempting to replace what you were with something that you're not and something you can never be. 
That's what Paul is saying in Romans. You're never going to be able to keep the law. You're never going to be able to keep it perfect. So allow him and his grace to come into your life. You stay with him. And then you will do the right thing. You'll do the things that are right in your life, but you'll do them from a place of his love, from being loved. And you will reveal his light, not because you're perfect, but because he is perfect. So when people see you, they shouldn't see perfectionism in you. They should see the perfectionism of the grace of God that is moving and working in your life. That even though you are broken, there's no better thing in the world than for people to see you that knew you, that knew you when, I don't even know what that means for some of you, but you do. Some of you just cringed. Ooh. You know, thanks to social media, more of us can find out who you were then than we used to. But there, to me, is no greater compliment in the world when somebody that knew you then looks at you and goes, you? You're a Christian? I don't mean somebody that knows you like yesterday. <laughs> what you did yesterday. Maybe you got problems if that's the case. But I'm talking about somebody that knew your past and they see you now. And it's not that you are so a total perfect person now, but the love and the grace of Jesus Christ is shining you. You're so great that all they see is him. That's the kind of perfect we need to be. Will you bow your heads to me? Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your faithfulness. God, help us to see ourselves not as perfect people, but as broken people filled with a perfect God. A God who is great in mercy. A God who forgives, who is all faithful. Lord, help us today. For some today, Lord, they might be making that confession for the first time. Lord, change my life. I'm tired of trying to do it on my own. I need to acknowledge today I am not perfect and I need you in my life. Help us today, those that have made that choice, have repented of our sin, have chosen to follow you. Help all of us today that have made that confession to not live and try to attain your approval, but to acknowledge that we have it, that you loved us, you died for us. Help us to live perfect, perfectly complete and totally in love with you and the people, revealing you to the world, showing people not how good we are, but how good you are, how much you love, how perfect you are. Help us today to change everything uh, about us. You transform us in your presence today so that we may be vessels, broken vessels that reveal a perfect God and you and your love. We thank you, Father, for what you're doing in us and through us today.